Municipal governments are comprised of local elected officials and encompass a range of administrative bodies, including cities, towns, villages, and municipal districts. This is the Political Trenches Local Government at Work, the show dedicated to talking about the most pressing issues confronting municipal governments throughout Canada. I, along with Ian McCormick, will provide insights and perspectives onto the challenges and opportunities that confront local governments as they strive to serve their communities. Today, we are continuing our journey through the municipal alphabet, and we bring you the letter Q, which stands for Quasi-Judicial Tribunal. Later in the episode, Ian and I will be joined by the chair of the Land and Property Rights Tribunal in the province of Alberta. But first, we will discuss the city of Regina, where one councillor was heckled by residents and some members of council for suggesting removing a toddler from the council meeting. Then we'll chat about a councillor in Cochrane, Alberta, requesting a publicly recorded statement from each member of council on whether they have confidence in their CAO. And then we head to Sault Ste. Marie to discuss one councillor's continuous talking about an already decided issue. But first, Ian, we're almost into October. How's the last two weeks been? Last two weeks have been good. I was actually counting on my fingers how far through the alphabet we are too, rather than halfway through the year. I think we've got, I think we're more, well, certainly more than halfway through this municipal alphabet, as you so eloquently call it. So it's, it's been good. I'm looking forward to what's ahead for the next few months as well. Regina Mayor Sandra Masters had to intervene at a council meeting earlier this month after a dispute arose over a councillor's decision to bring his toddler into the chambers. Regina Councillor Bob Hawkins, in a meeting, said, quote, the rules are pretty clear that only members of the council are allowed on this side of the hexagon, end quote. Hawkins' issue came after Councillor Dan LeBlanc took his seat behind the bar with his young daughter in tow. He is quoted to say, Hawkins, I'd ask the councillor to respect that rule. I'd ask him to figure out a way, and I'm prepared to adjourn the meeting while he does that so he can get his daughter out of the council circus. Oh, no. I'm going to rephrase that quote again because I, I read it once and it just really screwed up there. Quote, I'd ask the councillor to respect that rule. I'd ask him to figure out a way, and I'm prepared to adjourn the meeting while he does that so that his daughter isn't part of this council circus. The council meeting was already marred by frequent interruptions as members of the gallery expressed frustrations with the debate on the motion to declare a houselessness crisis in the city of Regina. Ian. The life of a council member can be daunting for anyone, particularly those members of the council who are new parents. How do councillors and council who are new parents balance the needs of their children with their elected roles and responsibilities? So first of all, I'm not quite sure from the way the article was phrased, whether the issue that the councillor had was whether the, with the presence of someone who was unelected or unappointed being on the other side of the council bench, or whether he was suggesting the conversation that was happening, the council circus, as you replied, you responded to it, is something that that small person ought not to be part of for whatever reason. I'm just going to take it from the first perspective, however, about this person is not elected at the age of two or three or four or whatever they were. It's a really odd one to me, and a large part of me thinks it's a whole bunch of a tempest in a teapot. And the reason is we are looking for councils across this country and likely beyond that represent the demographics of the people who live in that particular community, young people, old people, immigrants, people who've been here forever, whatever the case may be. And to actually have someone there, a father in this case, who had brought a toddler to a council meeting, I think kind of makes local government more appealing to a broader demographic to show that this can actually be done. Uh, we've seen changes come in the past few years where some municipalities have begun to offer childcare during council meetings for uh, parents of young children who want to attend the council meeting, either as the elected officials or maybe even participants in the gallery. We're seeing more municipalities offering parental leave as well as a potential benefit. And as, we're, as we become more of a whole representation on councils, 
we're going to be looking towards more new parents uh, who may be willing to stand on these councils and not the retired and semi-retired folks who are financially secure and don't have anything else that they actually have to do in terms of commitments that they've got within their lives that they can't put aside for the time of the council meeting. So I, this is peculiar. Now, this isn't the first time just this year where we've seen an incident like this occur. Uh, earlier this year, uh, a counselor from Whitehorse had their son, Theo, who was born in July of 2022 and has occasionally joined that counselor for meetings and community events ever since he was born. The counselor said that she thought that this was being well received, having a uh, child at the council meetings and at events, until she arrived, received a phone call from the mayor of the city of Whitehorse. According to the counselor, the mayor said some people had reported having a hard time hearing or saying focused during meetings with the son in the room and had also expressed concerns that the counselor was missing out on important information if she had to. For example, and I'm quoting what the alleged conversation was, step aside for diaper changes. So, Ian, we are seeing, and I, I just recently wrote a, a thing about this, we're seeing exodus of people leaving municipal realms for different reasons. If we start putting up barriers to stop newly, uh, new parents from joining the municipal realm, as you just talked about, is this going to hinder the diversity of our councillors and our who sits around council meetings of course it is of course it is yeah we're if we're so if people are self-selecting to remove themselves from the process either as elected officials who choose not to run again because it's it's not a healthy environment that they don't want to expose their kids to themselves to we're also self having people self-select not to run for office because they don't want to be part of this either we don't really know what that is what the number of people there are but I suspect it's quite significant. And another interesting piece to this is the fundamental reason why local government exists. And to me, anybody who's running for an office in a competitive election is there to make their community better over the long term. Municipal legislation speaks to that. What better way is there to look in the face of one of those people who are going to be there in the long term and say, this is why we're making the decisions today that we're making today, especially if those decisions are ones that may not be popular or maybe ones that cause short-term uh, pain for the idea of long-term gain. This is exactly why we're, we actually have a local government is to look after these kids' interests. So yeah, I want those kids represented. Now, if they're being disruptive and need a timeout, maybe the idea of childcare comes into play. Uh, so sure, I, I buy that as well. I would say though, if you want to be a stickler for procedure, the counselor who made the point does have a point. Now, also in the article was a reference that uh, there can be permission given for other people to be behind the line, if you like, on the part of the mayor. And the mayor uh, was open to challenge on that. The councillor, to my understanding, didn't challenge the mayor on that either. So there was a there was a way that the the small person, the the, the, the child, could actually be there anyway. I I think it's not all bad to involve our kids in the decisions that we are going to be making for them a generation from now. A Cochrane, Alberta town councillor has brought forward a motion asking each individual town councillor to make a public statement on whether they have confidence in the leadership being provided by the, their town and their current CAO. At the September 18th council meeting, the Cochrane councillor gave advance notice that a motion would be coming forward on September 25th and she said the vote is not personal in nature, but wants it to be recorded publicly for the sake of transparency. Now, Ian, this is a very delicate question I'm going to ask you here. The CAO is the only official employee of council. When a motion like this comes forward to have a public vote on confidence, the council of the entire council having in the CAO Either way the vote goes, does it not seal the end of the CAO's time in the community if it has gotten to this point where a councillor has brought forward a public motion of confidence? I don't know. Not necessarily. I don't think really? it's because it's, a, it's an individual councillor. In this case, she has raised this as a topic she would like to bring her colleagues on side with. 
it could be any number of things, right? I, she has the absolute right to raise the topic as a, as a topic of local governments, but she also has the responsibility to accept council's decision once they deal with it on September the 25th. So this is actually a really good way of testing the waters. So if, for example, she puts forward this notice of motion uh, and asks for it to be put on the agenda, and she's the only person who raises her hand to say, yes, we should put this on the agenda, that says something. If, however, more than half of council says, yes, we should put this on the agenda, well, maybe that's just a little bit different and that does start to, to, start to, to move that needle just a little bit. Although putting something on a council agenda for this debate doesn't necessarily mean that I, I for one, agree with it. It just means we're going to talk about it. Now, to me, she said as part of this article, too, that a lot of the guidance that she had taken was from social media or from uh, people who had attended her own coffee coffee, coffee date. shop type, coffee date. Coffee, what I would call the coffee shop Senate. So people who tend to agree with themselves. And I think that needs to be taken with a note of caution for the councillor and for council as a whole as well. People have self-selected either to participate on social media or to attend this coffee event. It may not be representative of the will or the opinion or the feeling of the broader community as well. And that's kind of why the whole council needs to get in, involved in this. So I, I, this gets to taking some of that advice from or guidance from those particular sources is not something that I would particularly rely on, but certainly she can raise it, but she has to accept what council says as part of it, which, as you were saying just off, off screen here, the between when we're, when we're brought, uh, recording today on the 25th of September and this coming forward on a motion on the 26th, 25th of September, this episode of Political Trenches will actually air after this. So I guess we'll find out if we were really brilliant or if we read the tea leaves, tea leaves wrong. Traditionally, these type of votes happen behind closed doors because is yeah. is this not traditionally an HR matter where it would be one of the three uh, reasons why you would have an in-camera session? Yeah, uh, you're referring to land, labor, legal, which is a kind of a broad generalization, but generally correct. You said the meeting would, sorry, the decision or vote would happen behind closed doors. It wouldn't happen behind closed doors. No, the vote but itself you, tra a traditionally a CAO's review happens behind closed doors. They never oh, do that's it out in public, public. And this is tradition. This seems like a review of a CAO, does it not? That does to me. It certainly seems like a referendum, a yes, no referendum yes. rather than a nuance on we have things you need to improve upon. So, for example, uh, frequently in a CAO contract in Alberta, where we're, where this this municipality is, it's mandatory for CAOs to have an evaluation by council every year. So it's part of the legislation. So how well the CAO is performing and how well they are delivering on their the, the goals that are in their contract is a legitimate exercise every year. So that part's legitimate. But as you have referenced, that conversation should be happening in confidence and shouldn't should not be aired in in the, in the open session of council until it comes to a decision about do we extend the CAO's contract or not? That's a that's an open question or an open session question. But the conversation about whether we have this is like a vote of confidence or a vote of no confidence in your only official of you as you have referenced. Now, talking about standing by a decision made by council, a Sault Ste. Marie councillor found himself reprimanded by fellow city council members earlier this month after he persisted in griping about an already decided issue. Council was about to vote on retaining a consultant to provide engineering services for the Queen Street reconstruction in Sault Ste. Marie. Council had already decided at their last meeting in August to commence the $6 million project next year. But the councillor who voted against moving forward continued complaining about the issue. The first term councillor said, I want to once again echo that I've been saying about this project from the beginning. This Queen Street improvement project is a swing and a miss. Now, the majority of councillors at the meeting spoke out against the councillor's words. Ian, I've spoken to municipal councillors and leaders from across this country, and they tell me that their role is to sell the council's vision to the public, whether they vote it for a certain issue or not, and rehashing these type of issues in the public could potentially in inflict challenges on council morale and possible challenges on the community. Could it not? Oh, absolutely it could, yeah. This is 
over and over and over again. If the same topic keeps coming up and again and again and again, it's council spinning. Well, one member of council uh, spinning their wheels and causing the entire business of council and therefore the municipality to slow down as well. So the we, we you know, sometimes we see this on budgets, for example, where a, a particular councillor will know that a budget say is going to going to pass because most people have spoken for it. But then they vote against it, just knowing that they're OK with it, but so that they can say they were standing up for taxpayer rights or fiduciary responsibility or being the fiscal hawk and just playing a little bit of politics with it. I don't know if this is politics or not, but if the councillor really wants to test this, much like the issue that we just spoke about in Cochrane, the councillor or one of the other members could put forward a notice of motion or a motion to reconsider the topic and test it. See if the other members of council vote in, in favor of a motion to reconsider. Now, the motion to reconsider would, has some nuance to it, and this person might not be able to do that, but another member of council might be able to do it on their behalf if they can convince that member of council to do it. So let it be done at that point. Councils need to focus forwards. You mentioned the vision for the community, that what they ought to be focused on, about the change that they're bringing about for the next generation of people who live in the Sioux for this, in this particular example. So this kind of rehashing or returning of the business of the municipality takes time away from discussing other topics which are new and would be advancing that vision or advancing the agenda that council has expressed for themselves. Now, I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate with you here for a second, Ian, because I feel like I need to, because um, the motion that he was talking about is a separate issue in itself about the original reconstruction of the road Queen Street into St. Marie. This is about the contractor who is going to be given the duty of actually fulfilling it. When you're in a council meeting, no matter how a pass vote went, you can still bring up your issues with a project, can you not, to talk about the reasons why you don't think this should be going forward and possibly even pause a project? Because in, unless the city has their own engineering and engineering firm, the project won't go forward until you hire a contractor who's actually willing to do the work. I suppose you, I suppose you could. Uh, the... Something to this, too, is that the actual letting of a contract is usually not within the realm of council anyway. In a case like this, it would most likely be the engineering department or the city manager who would be actually affixing a signature to the contract. The, the details of the contract or the project that needs to be complete or the, the overall master plan for downtown redevelopment would be something that's in the purview of council rather than the individual contractor who is actually selected to do the work. Because that then starts to put operational things in front of council who should be focusing on governance topics. I say that without knowing the specifics of the bylaw that that this uh, this councillor may be working under. So we'll be right back after a quick break with our interview with Sarah McRory. The views and opinions expressed by Chair Susan McRory are those of Mrs. McRory's and do not represent the views of the Alberta Provincial Government. Welcome to Cues for Quasi-Judicial Boards on the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Susan McRory. Susan spent 20 years as Alberta's Chief Environmental Prosecutor. During that time, she helped develop and grow the province's system of creative sentences for environmental offenders. Prior to her work in the environment, she was a full first full-time female Crown Prosecutor north of Edmonton and the first woman appointed as Chief Crown Prosecutor west of Ontario. Leaving Alberta Justice in 2013, she served as a member of the Environmental Appeals Board of Alberta, a public member with the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Alberta. And in 2018, Susan became the board chair of the Land and Property Rights Tribunal, which has just been recently renamed in the province of Alberta. So with that, Susan, welcome to the Political Trenches. Thank you so much. So before we get underway, I, I know you just have a brief little statement you want to make, so that way our listeners and viewers know where you stand before our interview gets underway. Yeah. Just want to make it really clear that I'm not going to be talking about specific cases, and I'm not going to be talking about the direction that the tribunal may or may not take, because that's not fair. But I can talk about process, and I hope I can provide some information that will be of assistance to your listeners. Thank you so much. So 
I want to start with sort of a bit of an educational question, if you will, because uh, I, I'm coming into this a little bit green. Ian may know a little bit more about this issue than I do, but can you briefly explain to myself and to my list, our listeners, what exactly is a quasi-judicial tribunal or board in the province of Alberta? Hint, quasi-judicial. It means sort of like a court. We're actually almost, I like to call it almost a halfway house. When there are decisions that need to be made, you can go to the court or you can go to your political uh, masters and ask that that decision be made. But there's thousands, millions of disputes that are out there. And many of them are not appropriate for the courts because the courts are expensive and sometimes inaccessible. And there are thousands and millions of disputes that politicians don't have the time and don't want to make the decision on because the decision is something that's not going to make anybody happy. So we're, uh, we are one of the tribunals, but this idea that there are quasi-judicial tribunals out there is 150 years old. This isn't the new thing. It's just we are the tribunal that uh, deals with decisions that makes decisions on various statutes that have been given to us to deal with. So we, uh, we're looking specifically at the Land and Property Rights Tribunal and, and its relationship to local government here in Alberta and beyond. How does the tribunal fit within kind of that realm? You mentioned the, the judiciary, you talked about the legislature. How does it realm, relate then to local government as well? Again, we're sort of in the middle. When there's disputes between, let's say, two municipalities under the Municipal Government Act, it's called, uh, that is a dispute that comes to us for a decision. If there's a dispute about annexations, again, between two municipalities, that's a matter that comes to us. I think your uh, listeners will know more about what's on the uh, municipal government side of the fence. They'll also know that if there's a dispute as to the valuation of a commercial building, like the one that I'm sitting in, that the tribunal sends a presiding officer to decide on those assessment matters. Um, your listeners may also be familiar with what we call designated industrial properties or DIPs, that's how we call them, where there's a fight between what is the assess assessed value of a major industrial facility. Again, we are the decision makers there. I mean, I don't want to have a sound fancier than we are, but the better comparator is we are more like judges because within the area of work that has been assigned to us, we decide and our decisions are final unless overturned by the courts. I want to talk about the makeup of the board, if that's okay for a second, because um, I, I think of a tribunal, I think of a judge, right? I think of someone sitting at a, the front of a courtroom, and not that I have experience with it. I'm not saying I do. I'm just saying that I, I, that's how I, Good. I picture Good. it. <laughs> Thank you. Can you can you explain to me and the, sort of the myth of what a quasi judicial tribunal might be is a court system, but it's not right. It's members of the general public who are appointed by the provincial government. Correct. Yeah, but that's what judges are too. That's exactly what judges are. We're different in that we don't have tenure, so that it is we are uh, appointed at Her Majesty's pleasure, or sorry, His Majesty's pleasure. It's hard to remember that now. But yeah, we do not have tenure, but and we apply to be appointed to the board just like you would uh, applying for any kind of government job. The folks who do sit are experts in their own fields. Um, this is not like you're a public member where you're offering oversight, you're offering an opinion, sort of in an advisory capacity. We are decision makers. And so we need to be experts in our respective fields. And that's typically engineering, law, architecture. Uh, we, have, um, we have several folks who are experts in the municipal government governance side of the fence. We have teachers. 
We have ranchers, we have a turkey farmer, we have uh, uh, grain farmers. So it's important that the tribunal have this broad base of expertise. And these are people that are experts in their field. These are not uh, people of, you know, these are people with a long history in their area of specialization. Hmm. I'm going to follow up on that one if I might. You mentioned the panel a couple of times, which to me indicates there's more than one person on this entity at a time looking at a particular topic or subject. How do you decide how many people would comprise a panel and whether you're the type of expertise you'd be looking to on that panel? Um, you can have a one person panel. Okay. You can have a three person panel. And on major um, hearings, we have a five person panel. And it's a question of what does the file require? What does, what's needed? If it's a, 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 what we call a written hearing, then perhaps only a one person panel would be sufficient. And that's of course the fastest panel of them all because there's only one person. And so high volume um, cases would typically be referred to a one person panel. That typically, um, anytime you're ap applying for rental compensation, it's probably before a one person panel. If you are applying for an increase in your annual payment, almost universally a three person panel. Most of the hearings, the, whether they're in person or virtual, are before a three person panel. Right now, we have a five-person panel dealing with a designated industrial property appeal that is, I think, in its seventh or eighth week of hearing. So obviously, when it's a very, very long hearing, I want to be sure that we don't lose anybody because of illness. And of course, just the work is so extraordinary that it is of assistance to have it shared with five folks as opposed to three. I assume it's not a coincidence that they're all odd numbers. Is this a, is this a, like a majority decision? Like a, no. Um, but it it has to be an unequal, uh, number. We do have the ability for a dissent. It is okay. you have a three person panel. Two people can decide one way, and the the third person has the ability and, if appropriate, to write a dissent. It's very much the court of appeal works exactly the yeah. same way. Okay. And how, I mean, you mentioned uh, several thousand cases this year. Are you seeing caseloads increase or reduce? I, mean, I think you also talked about this being now a combination of other previous quasi-judicial boards as well. So what's happening yeah. with that? The number of applications are going through the roof. Um, on one area within surface rights alone, this is just surface rights, one kind of application. I think we had 6,100 applications last year. Surface rights, generally about 7,000 applications. Now that includes the 6,100. So we have a tremendous increase. Uh, we also do um, subdivision appeals, roughly 40 a year. But two years ago, we acquired jurisdiction for subdivision and development appeals, doubling the workload in that area. Um, on the assessment side, it's very variable. It's really we're so much tied to what the economy is doing. And on the commercial assessment side, the numbers have gone down. We used to have about 1,000 hearings a year. I think this year we're at 700, something like that. But on the designated industrial property side. I think we went four years without any hearings. And now we're in the biggest hearing I think the tribunal has ever had. And going forward, there's a number of files that are in the hopper, so to speak. So it changes and you have to be aware of those changes and respond to it in the recruitment. I'm going to ask the very stupid question right now, and I apologize for this, but <laughs> when does the tribunal get involved? So what is the process from 
someone having an issue to when you get involved. And I, I apologize if I ask it that way, because oh. you talk about the SDAB. I'm like, hey, I sat on SDAB for like two years and I had no appeal. So I didn't really do anything for it. But yeah. how does a, an issue get to your desk? And yeah. what is the process where you have to say, okay, this is land and property rights tribunal board material, or this is for another quasi-judicial board material because i think there might be a misconception because i'm gonna i'm not gonna lie i, th I thought it was just like another justice system where people just get sued and they go in front of you but it sounds like that's not the case <laughs> and it, you know I, i'm sorry you asked me to stay sit steady i could go and get my my legislation and <laughs> wave it in front of you that's the point it's in the legislation that's how things get to us. And it depends what piece of legislation you're talking about. You said you're more familiar with the subdivision. That's under the Municipal Government Act. Mostly when we're under the Municipal Government Act, we're dealing with appeals. Somebody else has made a decision at a lower level, and one of the parties isn't happy with it. And they come to us as the appeal authority saying, somebody lower down made a mistake, yes or no. So if you had a subdivision, it, Chris, if you had been uh, sat on a panel and had made a decision as a local subdivision and one of the parties objected to it, the matter, if it had a provincial impact, would come to us. We don't do them all. We couldn't do them all. That would be impossible. But where the impact has an effect beyond the local community, it comes to us. Surface rights is different. Surface rights is a trial. It's a trial in the first instance and where the parties are, they apply, whether it's to get compensation, whether to increase the compensation, um, whether to claim for damages, they apply, and they come to us. And you make a really good point. We have to decide, is this something that is within our jurisdiction to do, yes or no? That is the first and primary directive question that we have to consider each and every time, because we're not in charge of the universe. We're only in charge of our part of it. Now, you're, you are based in uh, Edmonton, if I'm not mistaken. Your offices right. are in Edmonton. The provincial capital is Edmonton. But issues just don't happen in Edmonton. And they happen in Medicine Hat, Brooks, High Level, Fort McMurray. Uh, I know traditionally since uh, past the pandemic, we have moved into a more virtual world where we can have these conversations and these uh, uh, tr tribunals uh, virtually. But do you have members of the uh, Land and Property Rights Tribunal across this province, or are they traditionally more in Edmonton? And when an issue arises, say, in Brooks, does the tribunal have to go to Brooks and do hearings there, or do they traditionally do them more virtually now? Well, um, yeah, a bunch of questions there. And you're going to say Actually, it depends, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think we have more members in Calgary than we do in Edmonton. Okay. Um, because, again, we had um, we do hearings in Edmonton. We do them in Calgary. We've done them all over the province. It's a question again. What does the file require? With the virtual world, we have found that the virtual hearing actually accommodates more people, makes us more accessible. You are the farmer isn't disadvantaged by the fact that he has to take three days away from his farming operation to make an appearance before it. That farmer now can do his morning milking and come into the hearing. On the other hand, there are litigants, participants for whom the virtual is a wall that cannot be scaled. The, you know, the technology is too difficult. Maybe there's hearing problems. Maybe there's conductivity problems. So what we've come up with, and again, this is enshrined in the rules that we follow. The default position is typically going to be a virtual hearing. And the reason for that is not because 
anything else other than the volume is so extreme. That's the way we can handle it. We could not handle the volume if we were forced to go back to all in person. On the other hand, if the fairness of the hearing is impacted by the fact that it is virtual, then you listen to both sides and a decision is made. And again, we have certainly done per in-person hearings, even in the midst of the pandemic. It was very difficult to arrange for a venue that was big enough that we could have everybody separated by what we had to do and follow all of the rules. But it was important to the fairness of that hearing. And so that's what was done. Susan, I want to take a moment and thank you from both Ian and myself for sitting down for the last half hour and chatting about the quasi-judicial tribunal system, the land and property uh, rights tribunal, and yourself. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart and from Ian. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Our full interview with Susan will be airing one week from today, next Wednesday, so tune in for that. We'll be right back after this quick message. Ian, another fantastic interview, another fantastic show. Uh, we are uh, coming to the end of our municipal alphabet row, and we might have to switch it up to go to the municipal numerical system here soon. <laughs> yeah, we got ten more to go, as far as I can tell. But, yeah, uh, and today was today was good. I I learned I wasn't quite sure what to expect around quasi judicial boards, but I learned a ton of things that I hadn't known before. I knew that they existed, but Susan was really good in telling us a little bit more about how they fit into the whole landscape too. And that was really helpful. Before I let you go, I, I want to pose a little question to you here because sure. uh, early, earlier this week, actually last week, the village of Carbon, who has been under governmental administration for some time because uh, the majority of their councils had stepped down, went to a by-election. Three new councillors have been elected. Um, I just want to know for a little bit of an educational experience for myself, what's the transition period from when the government role, the provincial government's role ends and the new council takes over? Is it the moment a uh, council member is sworn in and the provincial government just picks up or the administrative body just picks up and leaves? <laughs> well, I'll talk about the perspective from Alberta because that's the one I know. It might be slightly different elsewhere in Canada as well. So once, a, unlike the federal or provincial governments, where there is a transition period between being elected and taking office, in Alberta anyway, uh, once a local government election has occurred, that person is now sitting as mayor or councillor. So essentially the next day they can start receiving briefing notes or briefing books. They can, the swearing in will come a little bit later. And it's, while it's, it's not, while it's important, it's not something that prevents somebody from taking office right away. So conceivably the province could detach itself the day after the election in reality there's usually a bit of a not if not a transition period then a mentoring period where the the, the local authority takes over the provincial authority uh, backs off but there's there's that changeover that happens a little bit too a week or two weeks then where depending on contracts of the official administrator where that person will begin to back off and it also so it's, not, it's to, not like a light switch where they just leave the day after, right? They turn off the lights as they leave that night and then they come back the no. next day. <laughs> no, they leave the, the key in the door as they go out. No, and it, it also depends too on who who is coming and going. If it's a CAO, if it's part of council, if it's all of council, each one of those will have a slightly different process. I appreciate you educating sure. me on the roles and responsibilities of municipal governments. Um, but we will be back in two weeks time with the letter R. Uh, and we look forward to, uh, I, well, I'm looking forward to getting back out on the road here a little bit, and we will see you in two weeks' time, Ian. See you in a couple of weeks, Chris.